A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain, Chapter 16, Morgan Le Fay. If knights errant were to be believed, not all castles were desirable places to seek hospitality in. As a matter of fact, knights errant were not persons to be believed, that is, measured by modern standards of veracity. Yet, measured by the standards of their own time, and scaled accordingly, you got the truth. It was very simple. You discounted a statement, 97%, the rest was fact. Now, after making this allowance, the truth remained, that if I could find out something about a castle before ringing the doorbell, I mean hailing the warders, it was the sensible thing to do. So I was pleased when I saw in the distance a horseman making the bottom turn of the road that wound down from the castle. As we approached each other, I saw that he wore a plumed helmet and seemed to be otherwise clothed in steel, but bore a curious addition about, a stiff square garment, like a herald's tabard. However, I had to smile at my own forgetfulness when I got nearer and read the sign on his tabard. Persimmon soap, all the prime done use it. This was a little idea, idea of my own and had several wholesome purposes in view toward the civilizing and uplifting of this nation. In the first place, it was a furtive, underhand blow at the nonsense of knight errantry, though nobody suspected that but me. I had started a number of these people out, the bravest knights I could get, each sandwiched between bulletin boards bearing one device or another, and I judged that by and by, when they got to be numerous enough, they would begin to look ridiculous, and then even the steel-clad ass who hadn't any board would himself begin to look ridiculous because he was out of fashion. Secondly, these missionaries would gradually, and without creating suspicion or exciting alarm, introduce a rudimentary cleanliness among the nobility, and from them it would work down to the people. If the priests could be kept quiet, this would undermine the church. I mean, would be a step toward that. Next, education, next, freedom— and then we would be get, she would begin to crumble, it being my conviction that any established church is an established crime, an established slave pen. I had no scruples, but was willing to assail it in any way, with or without weapon, that promised to hurt it. Why, in my own former day, in remote centuries not yet stirring in the womb of time, there were old Englishmen who imagined that they had been born in a free country— a free country with the Corruption Act and the test still in force in it, timbers propped against men's liberties and dishonored consciences to shore up an established anachronism. My missionaries were taught to spell out the guilt signs on their tabards. The showy guilting was a neat idea. I could have got the king to wear a bulletin board for the sake of that barbaric splendor. They were to spell out these signs and explain to the lords and ladies what soap was, and, if the lords and ladies were afraid of it, get them to try it on a dog. The missionary's next move was to get the family together to try it on himself. Was to get the family together and try it on himself. He was to stop at no experiment. He was to stop at no experiment, however desperate, that could convince the nobility that soap was harmless. If any final doubt remained, he must catch a hermit. The woods were full of them. Saints they called themselves, and saints they were believed to be. They were unspeakably holy and worked miracles, and everybody stood in awe of them. If a hermit could survive a wash, and that failed to convince a duke, give him up, let him alone. Whenever my missionaries overcame a knight errant, on the road they washed him, and when he got well they swore him to go and get a bulletin board and disseminate soap and civilization the rest of his days. As a consequence, the workers in the field were increasing by degrees, and the reform was steadily spreading. My soap factory felt the strain early. At first I had only two hands, but before I had left home, I was already employing fifteen and running night and day, and the atmospheric result was getting so pronounced that the king went sort of fainting and gasping around, and said he did not believe he could stand it much longer, and Sir Lancelot got so that he did hardly anything but walk up and down the roof and swear, although I told him it was worse up there than anywhere else. But he said he wanted plenty of air, and he was always complaining that a place, that a palace was no place for a soap factory anyway, and said if a man was to start one in his house, he would be damned if he wouldn't strangle him. 
there were ladies present, too. But much, of the, but much these people ever cared for that. They would swear before children if the wind was their way when the factory was going. This missionary knight's name was Lacote Male Tail, and he said that this castle was the abode of Morgan Le Fay, sister of King Arthur, and wife of King Urians, a monarch of the realm about as big as the District of Columbia. You could stand in the middle of it and throw bricks into the next kingdom. Kings and kingdoms were as thick as Britain, were as thick in Britain, as they had been in little Palestine in Joshua's time when people had to sleep with their knees pulled up because they couldn't stretch out without a passport. Lacote was much depressed, for he had scored here the worst failure of his campaign. He had not worked off a cake, yet he had tried all the tricks of the trade, even to the washing of a hermit, but the hermit died. This was indeed a bad failure, for this animal would now be dubbed a martyr, and would take his place among the saints of the Roman calendar. Thus made he his moan, this poor Sir Lacote Mailtail, and sorrowed, passing sore. And so my heart bled for him, and I was moved to comfort and stay him. Wherefore I said, Forbear to grieve, fair knight, for this is not a defeat. We have brains, you and I, and for such as have brains there are no defeats, but only victories. Observe how we will turn this seeming disaster into an advertisement, an advertisement for our soap, and the biggest one to draw that was ever thought of, an advertisement that will transform that Mount Washington defeat into a Matterhorn victory. We will put on your bulletin board, patronized by the elect. How does that strike you? Verily, it is wonderfully bethought. Well, a body is bound to admit that, ju that for just a little one-line ad, it's a corker. So the poor Cole Porter's griefs vanished away. He was a brave fellow, and had done mighty feats of arms in his time. His chief celebrity rested upon the events of an execution like this one, like this one of mine, which he had once made a damsel named named Male Descent, who was as handy with her tongue as was Sandy though in a different way, for her tongue charmed forth only railings and insult, whereas Sandy's music was of a kindest sort. I knew his story well, and so I knew how to interpret the compassion that was in his face when he bade me farewell. He supposed I was having a bit of a hard time of it. Sandy and I discussed his story as we rode along, and she said that Lacote's bad luck had begun with the very beginning of that trip, for the king's fool had overheard him on the first day, and in such cases it was customary for the girl to desert to the conqueror. But male descent didn't do it, and also persisted afterwards in sticking to him after all his defeats. But I said, suppose the victor should decline to accept his spoil. She said that that wouldn't answer. He must. He couldn't decline. It wouldn't be regular. I made a note of that. If Sandy's music got to be too burdensome sometime... I would let a knight defeat me on the chance that she would desert him. In due time we were challenged by the warders from the castle walls, and after a parley admitted. I have nothing pleasant to tell about that visit, but it was not a disappointment, for I knew Mrs. Le Fay by reputation, and was not expecting anything pleasant. She was held in awe by the whole realm, and she had made everybody believe she was a great sorceress. All her ways were wicked, all her instincts devilish, she was loaded to the eyelids with cold malice. All her history was black with crime, and among her crimes murder was common. I was most curious to see her, as curious as I could have been to see Satan. To my surprise, she was beautiful. Black thoughts had faded to make her expression repulsive. Age had, f black thoughts had failed to make her expression repulsive. Age had failed to wrinkle her satin skin or mar its bloomy freshness. She could have even passed for old Urian's grandmother, granddaughter. She could not have been mistaken for sister of her own son. Or she could have been mistaken for sister of her own son. As soon as we were fairly within the castle gates, we were ordered into her presence. King Urian's was there, a kind-faced old man with a subdued look, and also the son. Sir Ewell, 
Sir Uwain de Blanche Mains, in whom I was, of course, interested on account of the tradition that he had once done battle with thirty knights, and also on account of his trip with Sir Gawain and Sir Mahas, which Sandy had been aging me, which Sandy had been aging me with. But Morgan was the main attraction, the conspicuous personality here. She was head chief of this household, and that was plain. She caused us to be seated, and then she began with all manner of pretty graces and graciousness to ask me questions. Dear me, it was like a bird or a flute or something talking. I felt persuaded that this woman must have been misrepresented, lied about. She trilled along and trilled along, and presently a handsome young page, dressed like a rainbow, and an easy and undu an undulatory and as easy an undulatory of movement as a wave, came with something on a golden slaver, and kneeling to present it to her, undid his graces and lost his balance, and so fell lightly against her knee. She slipped a dirk into him as a matter of course, away as another person would have harpooned a rat. Poor child, he slumped to the floor, twisted his silken limbs in one great straining contortion of pain, and was dead. Out of the old king was wrung an involuntary oh of compassion. The look he got made him cut it suddenly short and not put any more hyphens in it. Sir Ewain, at a sign from his mother, went to the ante-room and called some servants, and meanwhile Madame went ripping sweetly along with her talk. I saw that she was a good housekeeper, for well she talked, she kept a corner of her eye on the servants to see that they made no balks in handling the body and getting it out. When they came with fresh clean towels, she sent back for the other kind, and when they had finished wiping the floor and were going, she indicated a crimson fleck the size of a tear, which their duller eyes had overlooked. It was plain to me that La Cote Maltele, or that La Cote Maltel, had failed to see the missteps of this house. Often, how louder and cleaner than any tongue does dumb, circumstantial evidence speak. Morgan Le Fay ripped along as musically as ever. Marvellous woman! And what a glance she had, when it fell in reproof upon those servants. They shrunk and quailed as timid people do when the lightning flashes out of a cloud. I could have got the habit myself. It was the same with the poor old Br'er Urians. He was always on the ragged edge of apprehension. She could not even turn toward him, but he winced. In the midst of the talk I let drop a complimentary word about King Arthur, forgetting for the moment how this woman hated her brother. That one compliment was enough. She clouded up like a storm. She called for her guards and said, Hail me these varlets to the dungeons. That struck cold on my ears, for her dungeons had a reputation. Nothing occurred to me to say or do, but not so with Sandy. As the guard laid a hand upon me, she piped up with the tranquillest confidence and said, God's wounds, dost thou covet destruction, thou maniac? Is it, it is the boss. Now, what a happy idea that was, and so simple, yet it would never have occurred to me. I was born modest, not all over, but in spots, and this was one of those spots. The effect upon Madame was electrical. It cleared her countenance and brought back her smiles and all her persuasive graces and blandishments, but nevertheless she was not able to entirely cover up with them the fact that she was in a ghastly fright. She said, La, but do list to thine handmaid, if one, as if one gifted with powers like to mine might say the thing which I have said unto one who has vanquished Merlin, and not be jesting. Be mine in, by mine enchantments I foresaw your coming, and by them I knew you when you entered here. I did but play this little jest, and hope to surprise you into some display of your art, as not doubling, as not doubting that you would blast the guards with a cold fire as consuming them to ashes on the spot, and marvel much beyond mine own ability, yet one which I have been childishly curious to see. The guards were less curious, and got out as soon as they got permission. 